Good morning. So good to see you. You sounded great for a bunch of people who lost an hour's sleep last night. <laughs> you did a really good job today. Uh, we're in a series called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, and uh, we're learning that uh, there's a connection uh, between our emotions and how healthy they are and our spirituality and how healthy it can be. And today we're going to talk about dealing with anger. So before you say, aha, I'm glad the person that I know who struggles with this is here today. Let's just start by acknowledging we all struggle with this a little bit. I was in college at the time when I was driving down the road and I lived in Jamestown, New York. And, and a couple of features about Jamestown streets is that they're brick, they're brick streets. And secondly, is that they, uh, they're narrow. And so uh, when people park on the street, there really isn't room for two cars to get by, though some people will attempt. And I was in the lane that had the right of way, but a person decided that they would try their luck. And as they drove past me, they smashed my side mirror on my car. And so I turned around and chased this person down and cut them off and got out and, and knocked on their window and they rolled their window down and I said, you just smashed my mirror. And they said, I'm sorry. I said, sorry's not enough. It's going to cost me $75 to replace that mirror. He said, all I've got is $40 in my wallet. I said, I'll take it. <laughs> and I did. Can you imagine if I did that now? First of all, I was surprised that he gave me anything. I am not known as the most intimidating personality. <laughs> There's some of you, like if you stop me and yeah, I'd give you money, but I don't know why that guy did. The truth is, is that we can struggle with our anger. Uh, spouses get angry at each other. Parents get angry with children, children with their parents. And the most common feature, in addition to getting angry, is the regret that we tend to experience following our anger. Our culture actually rewards anger. If you can rant in particular tones and use sharp enough words, you can go viral. Anger is like this explosion in the soul. And uh, we often think about the toll that it takes on the people who are on the receiving end of it, but expressing anger like that also takes a toll on us emotionally, physically, and spiritually. We have a way with our anger of turning words into weapons. And uh, you probably have had this experience yourself where it seems like it turns us into complete idiots. Anger has this other capacity. Once we're influenced by anger, it, it distorts what we hear and it distorts what we see. And so we're often not responding to what's actually happening, but through our perception of what's happening because we're so angry. But that's not the scariest part of anger. The scariest part of anger is that it can become a habit. We just get angry because we're used to being angry. And our culture is really good at focusing on feeding and fueling our fury. Yeah. We learn sometimes anger from the family that we were raised in. We can learn anger from the channels that we subscribe to. We can learn anger from the people who vented their rage against us. Eventually, we often want people to feel the way they made us feel. And this is when anger starts going off the rails. So we would expect when the Bible talks about anger that what it would say is just don't be angry. Just eliminate that emotion from your emotional vocabulary. But surprisingly, that is not what Scripture says. The issue is not that we get angry. The issues are more what, we, what do we get angry about and then what do we do when we are angry. Just two weeks ago, I made a reference to a passage of scripture where Jesus, in his anger, drove out people from the temple who were keeping people out from the temple. And today, we're going to take a look at an example of Jesus' anger that you might not be aware of. This one might have gotten by you. It's in Mark chapter 3. It says, another time Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there 
And some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. And then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger. This is Jesus angry. What's he going to do? Deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, and he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. What was Jesus angry about? There was a man there whose hand was unusable partly paralyzed, very weak. We don't know what the cause was, but we can imagine how that impacted and affected his life. It immobilized him in ways. It complicated life in a lot of ways. And while it wasn't a death sentence and that it would kill him, it could kill a lot of opportunities in his life. And he's in the presence of a person who can actually do something about that. Jesus can heal him. He's also in the presence of people who think there's one day a week where nothing is supposed to happen, including good things. And so Jesus is angry. There are people in that room that were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. And when you're looking for a reason to accuse someone, you pay careful attention to everything they say and everything they do. And when Jesus realized what was happening, he asks them a very uncomfortable question to which they don't say a single solitary word. He's met with complete silence. They cared more about a day than they did about a person. And Jesus looked around in anger. So what is he going to do? What is he going to say? He says, stretch out your hand. And his hand was already healed. What did Jesus do in anger? He healed somebody. That doesn't mean that he knocked the guy to the floor. He was angry. Just be healed. <laughs> he didn't do that. The Pharisees, in their anger, though, what do they do? They plan and they plot to end the life of Jesus. If you asked the Pharisees, they would have told you they were justifiably angry. But justified anger does not mean that any action is justified. Just because we're angry doesn't make what we do right. And we're all at risk for using anger inappropriately. In fact, the truth is we all have. Our anger can make us feel very justified. In fact, one of the things that can happen is we can refuse to forgive people out of our anger and feel justified. They don't deserve forgiveness after what they've done. We are angry and we justify ourselves from doing what scripture requires of us. Now, the solution to anger is actually not apathy. Apathy is a form of hate. We just don't care about someone, so we won't do anything to help them. And some of us, I mean, if you struggle with strong emotions, some of us would just prefer an emotional lobotomy where we just kind of quiet all those emotions in our lives. And some of us, when we've expressed our emotions, carry around a fair amount of regret after the fact. But the solution, the solution, according to Scripture, surprisingly enough, is not to eliminate our anger. That's, that's our assumption. That, that's what we wish would happen, but that's not what Scripture calls to happen. The challenge in Scripture is not that we get angry. The challenge in Scripture is what do we get angry about, and then how do we act when we're angry? Ephesians, uh, the fourth chapter, tells us this. In your anger, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. How does anger become a sin? Well, anger can become a sin when you act outside of biblical boundaries. When you start expressing violence, when you use your words to demean, disrespect, and to tear somebody down, when you justify actions that if they were committed against you, you know would be wrong. 
And so it's very easy to recognize sin when our actions go out of bounds. But that's not the only way we can sin in our anger. We can, anger can also become a sin when we refuse to address an issue. When because of our fear of how we might respond, we paralyze ourselves and take a step back and refuse to address what's going on, that we know it's not right. You see, anger is a God-given emotion. Some of you don't believe that, but it is. Anger is a God-given emotion that enables you to address something you would prefer to ignore. This is what scripture teaches us about anger. It's really interesting to me. We already sang it once this morning in a song. But when God was first introducing himself to Moses, one of the things he says is, I am the Lord, slow to anger. Why does God reveal him? Have you ever introduced yourself like that? I'm Bob Reeves, slow to anger. <laughs> Interesting introduction, right? What's he saying? He's not saying he's a no anger God, and he's not saying he's an always angry God. He's saying that he's a slow anger God, and as a slow anger, two things are required. One is patience, and the other is self-control. That's what he's telling us. I'm a God who is a patient God. Is there anybody in the room this morning that's glad God is patient with you? Yeah, I mean, I all know, we wish, we wish that God would always be patient with us and not those other people. When it comes to anger, how has that influenced your life? How is anger viewed in the home you grew up in? Who was allowed to be angry and who wasn't allowed to be angry? What makes you angry? And we see Jesus in anger healing. But Jesus didn't just show us by his actions. He also gave us teaching on anger. And we can find that in Matthew's gospel where it says, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard it said that to people long ago, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison and truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Jesus starts by saying, our Righteousness has to go deeper than the righteousness of rule keeping. But that's how a lot of us assess how we're doing in righteousness. It is possible to keep rules and be very angry. I've met people like that. I've been people like that. And Jesus says, if we want to enter the kingdom of God, We've got to go deeper than just keeping rules. As it turns out, God is interested in more than just behavior modification. He's interested in heart transformation. He's not just trying to get us to comply with a set of codes. He's trying to see our heart transformed. So back in that day, as for some people in our day, the standard was just simply this. Well, I haven't killed anybody. I won't ask how many people haven't killed anybody here. Not because I think you have, but there's some people who won't raise your hand for anything. And then the person next to you will think you are a murderer. <laughs> 
For Jesus, the standard of not killing someone was too low. Well, at least I haven't killed someone. Anger is an important thing. We need to recognize when something is not right in our world. We need to feel something when something is not right in our world. We need to do something when something is not right in our world. But that doesn't mean that we can do anything we want or we can do nothing. Anger is a really interesting experience because for the most part, it's kind of this, this momentary explosion that happens in our soul. But you know what we can do? We can keep that anger and nurse that anger and train ourselves to, to stay angry. And the way we do this is we keep recalling the thing that made us angry and we keep retelling the story to someone else. Oh yeah. And, and then if they get angry, oh see, see, I knew it, I knew it. And we remind ourselves. And, and scripture tells us, Nursing, holding, keeping ourselves angry, it's not good for us. And Jesus even goes into name calling. Name calling. What's the problem with calling someone a name? And the word he uses is raka. The, the word literally means someone who is good for nothing. And the way you would say it in the original language, it's almost like you're bringing up phlegm from your throat. Raka. Nobody wants to be that nickname, right? Yeah. It's like somebody tells you, well, I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. <gasps> Rock. <laughs> I'm a New England Patriots fan. <laughs> Rock. <laughs> yeah. I got vaccinated. <laughs> Rock. <laughs> I didn't get vaccinated. <laughs> Rock. <laughs> you voted for who? <laughs> Rock. Mm. Yeah. This is what's interesting is that when we start getting angry, we start seeing people as good for nothing. And that's out of bounds anger. Jesus didn't see anyone that way. And the challenge is that anger doesn't just do damage to others. Anger also destroys us. It destroys our relationships. It leaves us lonely. It destroys opportunities. Which, which erodes our potential in life. It can produce, anger can produce more stress and more physical problems than stress and anxiety do. That is proven in medical journals. We talk a lot about the anxiety in our world and how much damage it does to us, but anger does too. And the challenge is, while we are feeling in a way that is hurting us, we feel powerful in the moment. And, and God recommends, what he tells us is, just because you feel empowered to act doesn't mean you have the power to hurt someone else. Because we want to pay them back. We want to make something even. So somebody says, well, I just, I just don't want to be angry. That's, that's actually not enough. Uh, let's suppose you don't want to go to California and you go to the airport. Just as long as it's not California, I'll go anywhere. Is that really the option you're going to exercise? And a lot of people play the spiritual track in their head. Well, as long as I don't get angry. No, there's a place God wants us to go spiritually and emotionally. And just being able to keep our mouth closed and our hands in our pockets doesn't necessarily mean that we're living out anger in a biblical or appropriate way. So anger can be healthy if it motivates us to heal and to reconcile. And admitting we're angry can be an act of vulnerability. In fact, some of the angriest things I've ever heard said is while people are declaring they're not angry. And what I've discovered is when we can admit our anger, we're less likely to act out of bounds in it. So 
Jesus wants us to live with freedom, and now I'll ask the worship team to come out. He doesn't tell us that we're free to do whatever we want. We're not free to take a course of action that's destructive to someone else or to ourselves. He wants us to take a course of action that brings healing and restoration. When you experience anger, and you do, that anger is telling you a story. It's telling you something. Behind the emotion, there's something going on. It's actually revealing what you love. Because if you hurt someone that I love, I will experience anger. And when you are experiencing anger, something that you love is being challenged. It's at risk. It's being threatened. And for some of us, we should pay attention to that. Maybe it means speaking up for someone. Maybe it means starting a conversation that the lack of reconciliation has gone too long. But sometimes what we're angry about is, is that my reputation or my inconvenience, somebody slowed me down. They're just driving too slow. And that's all it takes. And we can be furious. So what are we supposed to do with this? First, pray your feelings to God. Pray your feelings. Don't tell God, I'm not angry. They just deserve. <laughs> okay. Just, if it would be a really interesting experience and maybe an important experiment when you're feeling anger to go to God in prayer and just say, God, the truth is I am really ticked off about this person and this situation right now. To start your prayer like that. And then when we're thinking about how to respond in anger, we can make a predetermination that no matter how angry I am, I'm still going to treat others with respect. I'm not going to use my language to dice them up, to cut them up, to put them down. I'm not going to use physical strength to harm them. I may confront an important issue, but I'm going to do it in a respectful way. And then we can act in ways that promote reconciliation. Now, Jesus, I don't know if you noticed, and maybe you thought I just read too far in the text. He's saying, if someone is suing you, see if you can resolve that issue on the way to court before you get there. So let me ask you, if you're trying to resolve an issue before you get to court, what's your attitude towards that person? Are you trying to intimidate them? Are you trying to belittle them? Or do you actually focus on the reconciliation? Jesus is saying, adopt an attitude in response that tries to resolve before things get too far. See, God wants you to be free, not free to do anything from bitterness or frustration, but a freedom that comes to be able to act when inappropriate things have happened to you or to someone that you love. So what do you need to do today? I know you thought I was going to say, what do you not need to do today? <laughs> no. What do you need to do today? Would you bow your heads? Uh, Father, um, it's hard for us to imagine that you ever get angry. It's hard for us to imagine that you've given us the capacity for anger. But once we begin to understand that there's a natural tendency we all carry to avoid, ignore, and to keep away from things that should be challenged in our lives or in the lives of those that we love, once we recognize that, it's helpful to realize that this emotion is a signal on the dashboard of our life. There's something that needs attention. 
there's an action that needs to be taken. Help us to do it in a way that promotes life rather than destroying it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.